So I must start by asking you about Soccer AM almost 20 years ago now. What was it like? Uh, yeah, it was mad, really. Um, the show, it was tiny when I took it over. It was like a little, little show which um, uh, was already on air. And it was more of a kids show, actually, kids football show. And they sort of gave me the keys to it. Originally, when they asked me to do it, I said no, because they wanted me to do that in a show called Soccer Extra. And they wanted me just to produce it. And then um, someone else at the at Sky Sports who knew um, that I you know, had the desires to be a TV presenter as well, um, said to the, to the big boss, you know, do you know he wants to be a presenter? And they phoned me up and said, do you fancy producing and presenting? I was like, yeah, sure, you know. Wow. Uh, Play, play a manager and when I took over it was this tiny little show and what was great about it was they didn't care about it they were just it just was stuck away on Sky Sports Saturday morning and obviously their crown jewels are the live sport and this show just started growing and growing and growing and the way the bosses get paid which is always good is they get paid as a percentage on their programs you know and how well they're doing they get a bonus and this was one of the shows which was like not supposed to do that well. And yet it was performing really well so that it was helping their bonuses. So suddenly they were all going, we don't know what you're doing, but carry on doing it. We love it. <laughs> and, and, and it was just, it, they supported it. It was great. We experimented to begin with. It was four hours. Then it went down to three hours. But three hours worth of TV is just, is just beautiful. You've got time to mess about and experiment. And because we were a very small show, I just found people around the office and said, do you want to come and work on it? It really was a group of people who were, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I had worked on the big breakfast and stuff, you know, but yeah. but it was just a group of people going, look, let's just have fun. And I think that's what came across on the show. Yeah, you did it for about 10 years, didn't you? But it seems timeless to me because the format seems very similar to it was when you were doing it. So the, the core format has really stood the test of time, hasn't it? Well, the thing about football is um, I've been around football playing and watching all my life. And... The thing that I think a lot of people might forget about it is I really enjoy it and I have fun. I've never gone to a football match and we've all walked out going, oh, my God, it's so miserable. We all have a laugh on the way home. If we, you know, when we're playing football, we lose. You get yourself up. You think about next week. If you're watching a football match, you lose. You're, you're a bit gutted, but you get yourself, you have a laugh with it. And it's like people forget that it's fun. And there were so many shows which came along which tried to imitate Soccer M. And, and, and there's so much around football where they just take it far too seriously. But right, there are that 1% of people whose who's whole, you know, year's ruined because of one result. Most of us have got mortgages to pay and, you know, kids to look after and stuff. We can't mope around about a football match forever, you know. And, and I think they've forgotten about the fun sometimes. So we spend a lot of time analysing football and not a lot of time going, do you know what, the player's having a real laugh and the fans are having a real laugh and we're having a real Everyone's having fun here. And I always think the best TV is when people are having fun. Yeah, it was amazing. Did you, did you ever ma imagine it would be as successful as it was? No, but it was, yeah, it was the 90s. It was really gung-ho, 96 when I started it. 90s was an amazing time. It was our 60s, our generation 60s, where everything was just fun. Everyone was pushing the boundaries. Everyone was having a go. The word had come along. There was um, a Brit pop. There was, uh, you know, Brit artists happening. There was the, uh, there was the you know, the, the mass movement of... Uh, of, uh, you know, women becoming equal to men, which was sort of the, they called it the ladette culture. And there was like loads of uh, women front of bands and stuff. The whole thing was just mental out there. It was insane. And it was like, everybody was just, we thought we'd, we thought we'd solve the world. Little did we know. <laughs> but, but, you know, and it was just so every, everything was buoyant and fun and everyone was up and Britain felt like a great place. Um, everyone had decided the Union Jack was cool again. And so, you know, it was just it was it was exciting and football had come along. Um, well, football had always been there, but it had just it'd been reinvented. Uh, the Taylor Report had meant that they had to have all seater stadiums, which meant the grounds were, were all brand. They all started looking brand new. The sport yeah. started looking brand new. And then obviously uh, Sky Sports had got involved and the money started coming in. And, you know, and the early TV deals were tens of millions. Now we're on hundreds of millions, you know, and it's just yeah, a, it's a different world, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. So it all became exciting, sparkly new. And, and, it, and we just we just rode the wave. I mean, towards the end of my tenure, it was weird because it was impossible to get any footballers on. They'd become so huge. Yeah. They decided that their clubs had decided they couldn't come on the show anymore. Wow. The last so season you, I did. You did that till what, 10 years you did on there, didn't you? I think. Yeah. 
11 years, yeah. 11 so, years. Yeah. And then I, I also look back before we spoke, I, I see you've been on Blue Peter. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I have been on Blue Peter because I, I uh, was asked once to do it uh, for charity. And um, I, I was asked to present it, and uh, I can't remember what it was for. Like one of their charity things, wow. and, and and one of their one. Of, I think one of their presenters was out doing um, was out doing uh, sports relief, and so they decided that um, they needed someone to cover. And they'd found out that I'd auditioned for Blue Peter many many moons ago, okay. and uh, and I was obviously hopeless back then, or I didn't get the, I didn't get the job anyway, and it was just. The weirdest thing about doing that, Stephen, was I was on the show and then they went, you auditioned for this once years ago, didn't you? And I went, yep. And then they showed it. And I had like this out of body experience. I've never had it before. It's a nightmare when they do that. <laughs> well, I was just looking at it going, that's actually me. I, I, and I was doing that thing where I was bouncing on the trampoline trying to do an interview. <laughs> what was so surreal about it was I'd always told people I'd done it, but I'd actually started not believing myself because it was so long ago. And when I was watching myself do it, I was like, wow, that's really me. And I didn't really know what to do. It was but, but that very strange thing of leaving your body. And you, you, you I mean, I love Sunday brunch. How did that opportunity come about? Because, I mean, from football to then, Cookie, you've always been a queen uh, cook. No, well, what happened was, um, it's just such a strange scenario. I was Because it started as on BBC Two called Something for the Weekend. And and I was just, one day, my it was, I think it was a Friday, my, and I had the show on the Saturday or something, or a Thursday, and I had the show on Saturday. My agent gave me a quick ring and said, look, um, the BBC are interested in interviewing you for this job. And I was like, really? So they went, you've got to go today because they're, they're desperate. A presenter's fallen out. And it was supposed to be Andy Peters and um, uh, Simon Rimmer and Amanda Hamilton. So I went and met um, the uh, one of the bosses at BBC. And, and, and she said to me, look, this is really weird. I, I'm not sure you're going to want to do this because it's not as cool as Soccer M. And I was like, I don't give a damn whether it's cool or not. Do you know what I mean? I'm in TV yeah. to present. I like talking to people. That's what okay. I do. I mean, the reason the reason that Soccer M was really cool because one of the reasons was we couldn't compete against Ant and Deck and all the other people on the other side. So we were putting all the indie bands on and all the all the urban acts and stuff like that because because that they they weren't getting the gig on the BBC yeah. and ITV. So we were doing it. So it grew this massive cult status. It was amazing. But I, you know, I, I, I wanted to just present TV shows and the idea of messing around on a primetime TV show on a terrestrial channel was like, well, not prime time, but on a morning. So, so I just went and did the job and they said, can you come along and do a pilot? And I went along and did a pilot and I loved it. And they said, look, we're going to take it. She said, I don't know who you are. I've never seen you, but this guy here, and there's a guy on her shoulder who says, you'd be really different to do this show because you're not like all the other presenters. And then I was just like, yeah, I did the pilot and they just absolutely loved it and I, they went yeah you've got the gig I, was like, I couldn't believe it and then eventually uh, what happened was the BBC Trust decided to get rid of all daytime um, budget for BBC Two or BBC Two daytime budget and that included my show and what was really strange about that was we always like well we win the slot on Sundays we're the most watched program on a Sunday so they're just going to keep us anyway we were beating everything um, and they went, uh, and, and then we kept thinking, hold on a second, someone's going to come and rescue this show. But the BBC, the way it is, it's so huge. Not knocking the BBC here, by the way, everyone's got their own opinions on the BBC, but it's so huge. They didn't have one person. You know, like your company, you would have someone who'd go, hold on, that bit's working, let's keep that bit. It's yeah. worth putting money in that. They had no way of doing it. So they had wow. to let it let it go. And then Channel 4 and ITV went, well, this show's successful. Let's let's go and rob it. So they came in and, and took it. I never realised it moved from BBC One. And you've done that for, what, over 10 years now, haven't you, again? Yeah, well, B B B it was on BBC Two and then it moved to uh, Channel 4. And that and we're just about to celebrate our 10th birthday on Channel 4, yeah. So, wow, it's an amazing programme. I love it. I love it. And do you get any creative input into that? Well, yeah, yes and much more so now than I ever have done actually because when I turned up I was just a rented presenter and um and I was fine with that but but more so the problem is when it goes not the problem but when it goes live they can't stop me doing whatever I do so the atmosphere <laughs> is always set by me and it's because I'm the sort of presenter of the show so it's always set and it's always me messing about the guests absolutely love doing it now 10 years down the line they just always go we love coming on the show and when the PR people says Sunday brunch, they always go tick. Yeah, it's three hours. You've got a three hour opportunity yeah, to, to long, isn't it? But yeah, you, great people on it. Really, well, great. 
but why they love that Stephen is because because right if you could do the BBC News say in the morning breakfast news or something to promote your thing you're you're, you're allocated six minutes and it might end up being four depending on what the news is whereas my show it's three hours you got to and you'll be kept bringing backwards and forwards and, and you're, while you're there you're going to eat lovely food and drink alcohol and you know if you want yeah, it comes across as a really comes across as a really relaxed show really enjoy it really enjoy it and you'll be proud to so say it's one of our best performing tv shows for adverts so oh, we always have an advert in your um the middle of your show and it works exceptionally well that, exceptionally well for us that's great news what i was told once by chris evans never look at the ratings look who's advertising in your show <laughs> Because, ah, okay. because that has much more, uh, that, that's much more relevant because, yeah. co because co commercial companies are a lot wiser than, yeah, they are, <laughs> than anybody it's really else. really on brand for us and Channel 4 is a, a good station. So now lovejoycop.co.uk, um, which we're really happy to be supporting. What, what motivated you to launch that platform? Well, it, it was just one of those things that I was, I, you know, as, as, as you know, um, I've been doing the podcast for uh, quite a long time now and you've been very supportive of it. Thank you very much for that. And, and it's been it's been wonderful. And I just kept getting people write to me because uh, I talk about mental health. And I talk about diet. I talk about, you know, basically all these experts come on the on the on my podcast and. And I was getting a lot of young men, especially, but some some um, women as well. And they write to me asking me about how I deal with things like, for instance, losing my hair or uh, mental health. Um, and and I realized that it's quite tough out there to navigate life at the moment. I really do think that. And I wondered whether there would be an opportunity to get a, a lovely place where people could go for a reference to start learning. Um, I think people are aware who've listened to the podcast that I've had mental health. Um, like, uh, I'll call it issues, but I don't like to see it as that anymore. I like to see it as a, like a, a learning curve. But when I got depression, I, I decided that I was going to read and learn everything there was to learn about it. And I decided to start um, interviewing experts. And that's why one of the things which happened with the podcast and try and learn as much as I can about it. So so I have this sort of knowledge and I keep speaking to experts and I think life is quite hard to, to navigate through and there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I thought, wouldn't it be great to collate it all and put it together in, um, in one area and, and, and to try and make it so that people could come there, create a community of, of nice people, like minded people who are going, Let's, how do we navigate through this? How can, we, how can we be the best we can be and how can we be the most content and the happiest we can be? Yeah, I think that's finding a way to be content and happy with yourself, isn't it? Because I, I do work with people with mental health issues and I don't, I don't think they ever go away. I think you have to learn to modify your life, cope with them. Um, and learn to deal with them. And I think it's, yeah, certainly with men, it's a really difficult subject to, to broach and, and one that they're um, yeah, very reluctant to bring forward sometimes. I think it's an amazing initiative. What sort of topics will you cover? Well, I mean, everything from what, what we've been doing on the podcast. So obviously we just, can I just say one thing, by the way, you're really right about men there. I, I, yes. I've, been at so, I've been at so many parties and because I've been slightly outspoken about depression, I don't talk about it a lot on TV, but I talk about it a lot on the podcast. But people, I, but I have discussed it on TV. I've been at parties where mates will come sidling up to me and they say, uh, uh, Tim, I don't, don't feel very well at the moment. Um, uh, do you think, do you think going to see someone would help me? I'm like, yes, do try yeah. and find someone to, to help you. It's like, you know, and they go, have you got any books you could re recommend I read? But men are so worried about saying that they have mental health problems or, yeah. or you know, There's they're feeling. Isn't there, I think. There, there really is. And I, I think, I think, well, I mean, this is such a cliche thing, but I think women are very good at, at talking and men aren't. And I think, mm. and I also think there's a, you know, there's kind of this real barrier, but I have it so often where people come and do it because I've been supposed because I've spoken about it. Then, you know, um, uh, people talk about. It. So look, there's everything from yeah. from diet. I've done a lot on diet recently, and and diet is so important. And there's so much myth about diet out there. And you, you know, you 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 know this. You, I know you're a healthy person. You know, you've got to get good gut health. You've got to you've got to make sure you're having very a varied diet. You've got to make sure you're hydrated. All these things are really important. And the, and the more that the more I read about it, the more I realise that a poor diet leads to poor mental health. It leads to poor performance. Too, so. Yeah, I mean, I started trying to get healthy at the age of 
45, when I wasn't not healthy, but I didn't have a good diet. Uh, didn't exercise much. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to be heading up to my 50s, not being healthy and well. Um, and initially started gym work, but then I quickly understood how important the diet was um, and how important it is you get your nutrition. And I find it very challenging when you drive around or you go to supermarkets that the rare foods there isn't really doesn't cater for a healthy nutritional diet. Yeah. Um, so I think we live in a challenging world, but I see you're going to debunk some nutrition myths. What, what's your favorite myth, if you have well, any? Well, the thing is, I'm always learning. And one of my favorite myth is, uh, which I learned only recently, is well, I, I kind of knew it, but carbs have been demonized, right, by society. <laughs> you know, no carbs before March. You shouldn't eat carbs. Carbs will make you fat. I went to Rihanna Lambert, who's done, who's written this brilliant book called *The Science of Nutrition*, and she, it, her book is great because it's like, I, as I say to her, it's like a school book. You start learning about how the body works. Now we all listen yeah. and read all this stuff, but she actually breaks it down into the science. If you want to exercise, your body needs carbs, right? So it does need carbs to do it, and and so I exercise a lot, like yourself. I exercise every day. Yeah, and. I have gone for periods of time where I've really cut down on the carbs, really cut down on them, and maybe too much. Yeah. And so she, so she explains, that's not good for your body. And the one thing she says constantly is, you know, if you starve yourself of anything, like so you put yourself on a diet, your body will compensate. So say you put yourself on a, on a um, calorie control diet or something, you lose lots of weight, your body will start really quickly slowing down its metabolism, trying to store as much fat as possible because it's panicking. Yeah. Because you have got a disconnect from your body. Your body's trying to keep you alive and you're trying to look good for Instagram. It's, yeah. two, di <laughs> it's two different yeah, things which I, are going I, on. I, I was the same with carbs when I started just protein, protein, protein. Then I managed to do some work with a guy called Graham Close, who's a nutritionist for the England rugby team. And he taught me all about carbs and don't be frightened of them and you need to eat them. I think it's the balance of having the right carbs. So I wouldn't tuck into a pizza. So I'm, I've now educated myself on the right carbs, but I'm no longer nervous of them. And I actually feel much better in the gym for it. But I think it's understanding that you need that in your diet. Um, so really, really interesting. So I see that you've also engaged the service of a sports psychologist. I mean, I see a lot of similarities with sport and business. Um, sports really visual. We go to a football match, you, everybody points out the player that's done, yeah, he didn't play well, he didn't play well. And in business for me, it's uh, very similar to sport. You've got to turn up every day, you've got to perform well, but it's not as visual. So at KUKA this year, we've employed the services of... Um, guy called Martin Littlewood, who works with Steven Gerrard at Villa. And he's a sports psychologist for Premier League players. And he's working with us as a business to make sure that outside of business, that we all have a common aim, everybody can be happy, motivated, mindset is right. So I see a lot of summarizes. Do you, do you have any tips, any key tips in relation to that? Well, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, well, no, I'm thinking you're talking about David Bloom is on my website um, and he's uh, also he's done some stuff on, on there. And I've also done a podcast with him. I think it's just understanding the pressures of life. And um, I suppose the, the one thing that I think that is, is I understand is what is winning. We're, we're constantly told that we're supposed to be winning. But in life, most of it is if I, I really don't like the word winning actually I, I find that I find that quite a, a hard but if you get a sportsman let's just take sport for instance most of sport is either losing or getting injured or, or disappointment yeah. in some way very few times that you win and when you do win like Johnny Wilkinson's won uh, the world cup and then often talks about how you get depressed afterwards because you've you've achieved your goal I, th I think that is is a is a bit of a problem the pressures we put on people to constantly perform one thing yeah. that I've I, I've just do I'm going to be doing an article on uh, for next week is is the beauty of being in a team and I've realized that I've connected one of my mental health um one of my uh, periods of depression happened when I gave up football and I realized why that was was because with football you become part of a team there is something beautiful about being part of a team I talked to Bruce Daisley about this on on uh, on the podcast who used to be the uh, European um, CEO of uh, Twitter and he said trying to build a team which I know Cooker are really good at 
um, it, it, that's what is important um, in a workspace, that everyone feels they have a purpose. Now, when you stick 11 people on a football pitch, all of you have a purpose because you, you can't hide on a football pitch. Well, people yeah. do try and hide, but you can't hide because you're, you're playing. You still get taken off and someone else comes on. In an office sort of scenario and places like that, I think you, you possibly can feel like you're not part of a team. And I think that is where football, for me, made me feel amazing. Whether we won or we lost, we walked on there and we had a common goal. You look around at your mates and you're doing it together. When that, when that left my life, I had Soccer AM where we were a team together. Yeah. And, I, and I think people, the viewers can appreciate that. We, we all worked together. I put every single one of those boys on screen. And then when Soccer AM stopped, I was suddenly in a situation where, where's my team? I don't have my team anymore. And, and I think we don't realise how important that is. And I don't know how you felt, but during the pandemic, when people have had to work from home, everyone's going, oh, this is beautiful. It's like, is it? Isn't it much better to be together as a team? Isn't that yeah. where all the magic happens? Uh, I mean, there's some benefit from working for home, but I think the whole company ethos and culture derived from having a team, spontaneity. Um, yeah, I, there's a balance, I think, but inevitably for me, it was always about getting people back to work. Uh, and that's how you develop your culture. And um, it's very important to me that, really important. Well, thanks so much for your time. We're delighted to be able to support you with this initiative. Um, we wish you the best of luck with it. We hope it's a huge success. And yeah, I'd say really, really delighted. I think it's an amazing cause. So thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to say, because this is really important to me, the more I, I, I learn about life, the more I realise that life is about relationships. And when you're lying on your deathbed, when you look back, you're not going to think about the car you bought. You're not going to think about that lovely pair of shoes you had once. You're going to think about all the relationships you've had with, uh, could be animals, could be family, could be friends, could be work colleagues. And I love to say that I think the relationship I've got with you guys there, and I've said this to you from the beginning, uh, uh, and, and I know you've agreed with it, or I've said, it's, it's not the money I'm interested in, it's the relationship I'm interested in. Yeah, I, I want to... We, we love dealing with you. I watched, talking about very quickly, minimalism. I, have you watched the Netflix documentary on minimalism? I have, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, have. Very good. Amazing. It took, um, and anybody listening to this, I'd, I'd encourage you to watch it because it really, I didn't really understand it before I watched it, but for me, you've touched on things there that are important. Friends, family, it's not material things. And I think we're in day, we live in a society today where material things are seen as the most important and actually they're not at all. Um, amazing. Well, thank you for your time. Lovely you, to work with you, and uh, we will catch up with you again. Brilliant. Thanks a lot.